Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and a lot of what we're going to talk about here is going to uh, uh, refer back to what Larry spoke about in his overview presentation and what uh, Tom just talked about when he talked about monitoring. Um, just a little outline of the presentation that I'm going to uh, go through here today. And by the way, all these presentations are in the the the, full, the presentation folder of the of the at the link that you were provided. Talk about a little context and definitions before we start talking about optimizing treatment. Um, we're going to talk about removing how to, if we wanted to. Um, optimize the particle removal process in a conventional surface water treatment plant to remove cyanotoxins, how, what approaches might we uh, use for that? And then we're gonna talk about if we wanna remove cyanotoxins uh, using powdered carbon <clears throat> and, adsorb and adsorption uh, uh, pro as part of the clarification process, how would we optimize that? And then there's another, um, aspect of treatment for cyanotoxins where they can be destroyed through oxidation. And that is the next presentation that Larry's going to talk about uh, next, or after the first workshop, he'll talk about that. Um, so let's talk first about context. And I, I think it's kind of important to mention this, and Larry mentioned it in the overview, uh, but I'll go through it again. But really, uh, you know, treatment is not our best option. If we if we have a harmful algal bloom and uh, cyanotoxins are present in the concentration that is a concern, managing sources, switching sources are generally better options than trying to treat the water and take the cyanotoxin out of the water pr prior to distributing the water. And uh, those things should be uh, investigated fully. Um, uh, Larry mentioned that we had done some comprehensive, comprehensive performance evaluations at uh, different water plants, mostly in Ohio. Um, and I would say the majority of those water systems had some sort of sort of a non-treatment option that they could go to in the event of an HAB. Um, and that, that was an important part of what, what uh, they needed to look into uh, uh, to optimize their removal of cyanotoxins. So, but we will talk about treatment today. Uh, and we'll talk about physical removal of algae cells in uh, the uh, coagulation, flocculation, filtration processes in the plant. We'll talk about removal of them through, um, well, we'll talk about physical removal of algae cells that may contain the uh, cyanotoxin in those processes. And then removal of the cyanotoxins themselves through those processes. And we'll talk about adsorption and removal of the uh, powder activated carbon in those uh, uh, processes and then oxidation. Uh, that will be the next presentation. And Tom mentioned uh, the um, uh, definition of intracellular versus extracellular cyanotoxins. And he mentioned that Treatment approaches kind of depend on what you have. Sometimes you'll have intracellular, uh, majority intracellular cyanotoxins, and then uh, treatment would have to be designed to remove those types of toxins. Sometimes you might have uh, a, con a, a, a concentration of extracellular that is a concern, and sometimes you might have both. Um, uh, so uh, treatment would have to uh, uh, address whichever one you have. And, you know, in some of the, uh, I remember one of the water systems we worked at in, with, in Ohio, it was a transitionary uh, situation at that water system. If you took a uh, sample of the um, cyanotoxins in the water column of their source water, it might be mostly intracellular, but if you come back a, a week later, it might be mostly extracellular and, and vice versa. And, and what we find is that sometimes, even in the source water, these algal blooms are kind of a living um, conglomeration of cells and, and they will release or, or uh, release uh, cyanotoxins into the water outside of them at times and at other times they, they do not. So. It's, it's something, uh, but to design treatment, it, it really helps to know which one you're dealing with. So 
and I'm going to start with the, the second bullet here first, if you allow me to. It says, if cyanotoxins are extracellular, generally the treatment that is recommended is we would remove them, that versus adsorption and uh, onto activated carbon or well, usually activated carbon and then uh, remove the carbon in the clarification process. And we could also... Um, uh, treat the, those extracellular cyanotoxins via oxidation, and you would you would add enough of an oxidant to uh, lyse the cells um, if they're extracellular. It's all already out, outside of the cells, but you would you would uh, through oxidation destroy the cyanotoxin and, and break it into smaller organic compounds that are no longer a concern. If we go back, but if we have intracellular cyanotoxins there's kind of a couple options that we could use. And, and the first one there that's listed, option one, is the most um, commonly used. We want to carefully, because we know most of the uh, cyanotoxins are still inside the algae cells, we want to carefully remove the algae cells without lysing them and, and dispose of those algae cells. If uh, there are some instances, though, I know where water systems have said, okay, let's lyse the algae cells and then make the uh, uh, cyanotoxin extracellular and remove it via oxidation or, or, or via oxidation and adsorption. Um, <clears throat> so they would, add, they would actually add an oxidant at the beginning of the treatment process to, to lyse the cells and then adsorb the toxin. Uh, cyanotoxin afterwards. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about conventional surface water treatment in a moment, and I just want to make sure we're on the same page as to what we're talking about here. If we have um, a, a conventional surface water treatment plant, I hope you can see my pointer here. Um, <clears throat> normally, we would have some sort of a rapid mix process, a flocculation process, and a sedimentation process. Um, there is a waste stream that comes from the sedimentation process. And if we're trying to remove algae cells, we can remove um, the majority of them in that sedimentation waste stream. These three processes uh, grouped together here, uh, I'll refer to as clarification uh, in, in my discussions here. So um, uh, we'll keep that in mind. There's also the filtration process that follows the clarification processes that uh, where we have another waste stream and we can remove more algae uh, cells if they haven't already been removed here in the sedimentation process. Um, powdered carbon can sometimes be added in a rapid mix or it can sometimes uh, be added prior to a rapid mix. And we'll talk about differences and benefits of doing either one of those things when we get to that. And also we might have a, a, an oxidant uh, prior to uh, <clears throat> either in the rapid mix or prior to the um, rapid mix uh, uh, area of a water system. So, <clears throat> Uh, Tom mentioned a few minutes ago, and I'm just going to reemphasize this: that we might, we could, we would expect to get the majority of our cyanotoxin removal in the sedimentation process. So let's let's look at this some data from um, <clears throat> this group of of people that were doing um, uh, an investigation into uh, uh, clarification to remove uh, toxic cyanotoxin uh, or cyanobacteria. They did two trials and uh, a couple things to look at here. This is influent um, to the clarification process. So they had, they were uh, measuring microcystin LR somehow, and they measured 119 in their first trial coming in and coming out, they had, uh, coming out of the clarification process, only three. So that's a significant reduction and that kind of, um, uh, uh, supports what Tom had reported a few minutes ago. In their second trial, they reduced the in incoming uh, microcystin LR concentration from 60 all the way down to two. They also had some extracellular uh, microcystin LR uh, at, in this situation. And in the first trial, none of that was removed in the clarification process. In the second trial, again, the, the influent and, and effluent 
concentrations were the, were identical. So if we have intracellular uh, microcystins, generally we can get a lot of removal through the clarification process. But uh, uh, if it's just clarification without powdered carbon or some sort of an adsorbent in there, we, we don't expect to get too much of the um, uh, extracellular clarification. You might think um, microcystin LR might have some sort of affinity to the coagulant and might get bonded up in the flock somehow, but it doesn't appear that it's doing that in a significant amount here. It's, it's being removed in, either inside the cell or it's not being removed uh, in that clarification process, at least in these two trials. And the other thing I wanted to point out is um, <clears throat> on this data, uh, the EPA guidance for microcystin is long-term. We don't want it to exceed 0 0.3 uh, micrograms per liter. So even though the majority of this coming in was intracellular, we would be concerned about an extracellular uh, concentration of three or, or in the second uh, trial here, two, coming out of the, um, uh, 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 the clarifier. So we would want that clarifier to do a good job of removing all this intracellular cyanotoxin, but we'd need some other treatment to get rid of this portion, this extracellular portion, because even though it's much lower, it's not low enough. And uh, Tom also mentioned that one way, uh, one special study that we do with plants oftentimes to see um, how the plant is performing to start with, to give us a baseline sometime, is to do uh, what's called a plant profile. Plant, it says here, plant profile monitoring, develop a special study um, uh, to follow the movement of the contaminant through the plant. So we could do a plant profile to get a baseline we could also do a plant profile after we apply a treatment uh, strategy to verify that it's working the way we hope it does. And this would involve sampling the, at, uh, the raw water and, and finding some way to measure um, uh, what we're looking for there. Sampling perhaps the clarified water. If I had multiple clarification units, maybe I had parallel treatment trains, I might take a grab sample off of each one to, to see if one is performing better than the other. And um, <clears throat> sampling after filtration. Um, again, I might check more than one filter there if, if I thought one was performing better than others or, or not as well as the others. And then if uh, assuming a disinfectant is added afterwards here and there might be some more destruction of the cyanotoxin, and just to know what is the final concentration going out to my consumers, I would take a, a, a sample at the end here. And uh, that, that's, uh, uh, even though we kind of know what to expect, we kind of expect the majority of our uh, cyanotoxins will be removed, uh, in, uh, the intracellular cyanotoxins will be taken out in the clarification process. And, uh, uh, we expect, you know, uh, we have expectations for the oxidation part. We can use one of these plant profile tests to verify that and to look at different scenarios. And this is a, a repeat of the slide that Tom showed earlier that said in this instance out of a Lake Erie water treatment plant, they ran three trials and the majority of the cell removal was accomplished prior to filtration. Now, we don't, we don't know if about... Um, extracellular cyanotoxins uh, um, uh, uh, here. They were just me measuring chlorophyll. And um, <clears throat> so there might, there might uh, be a problem there uh, at this water system if the majority was extracellular, but at least as, as Tom mentioned earlier, it gives us an, uh, an idea of how well the treatment process of removing the cells, the algae cells. So let's talk first about how we might go about optimizing some of these processes. If we wanted to uh, look at uh, optimizing the just the clarifier process in our uh, conventional service water treatment plant, we could um, adopt an approach, a pretty common approach used by water systems during HABs to try to gently remove uh, intracellular uh, uh, toxins. So if um, 
if the majority are intracellular or even if just the, the there's enough intracellular in our incoming water that we want to make sure we remove it, we can try to gently remove those algae cells. And we can use JAR testing to identify optimal chemical dosages for clarification. Um, JAR testing for HABs is something we could spend a whole day on discussing. And, and it, uh, I've got some more slides where I'm going to talk about certain aspects of it in detail, but it's it's really kind of dependent on what methodology you have for doing testing and, uh, and what you're trying to find out through your JAR testing. Um, there is some <clears throat> indication that if you want to remove the cells without lysing them, you can check pH in your dry test to make sure that it is uh, uh, not at a, a low enough uh, pH level that it's going to start to lyse uh, cells. Um, <clears throat> another um, thing that you can check in in in, in the clarification uh, uh, process is whether or not you have to adjust preoxidants. Some operators do turn them off completely. So if it's a water system, say that's adding a permanganate as a preoxidant, uh, there's a lot of discussions about water uh, among operators. Do I turn down my raw water dosage so that I make sure I don't lyse those cells or do I just turn it off completely? And then, if I do turn it off completely, how do I adjust my coagulant dosage? Because now that I don't have the pre-oxidation, going, that's going to affect my removal of particles. So I might have to do some jar testing, and I could do this perhaps prior to an algae bloom, where I treat my raw water without the oxygen, If I, and, and, and say hypothetically, if I was turning off my pre-oxidant altogether, how would I have to adjust my coagulant? And then as Larry mentioned earlier, the raw water characteristics during algae bloom may not be the same as that, that jar test that you ran prior to the algae bloom. So you might have to adjust, make some fine tuning adjustments um, um, during the algae bloom because of those differences. Um, sometimes uh, we can optimize the clarification process uh, to remove algae cells by removing sludge more often. The idea is if you uh, collect that sludge at the bottom, say, of a clarifier, and uh, it's got those intracellular cyanotoxins uh, within the cell. The longer you hold them in there, the longer something might happen to those uh, cells and, and a re release could occur. Uh, so uh, gently gently settle them or, or remove them in the clarification process and then remove that sludge you know, more often. And special studies could be done on that also to see how more frequent clarifier sludge removal might affect the clarification process. And then the other, the other thing is uh, for that clarification process, if we have recycled streams, and this would go for you know, fil recycling filtered wastewater also, we might have to either lower the recycle um, uh, stream uh, flow rate or turn it off altogether during the HAB event uh, so that we don't recycle um, uh, uh, extracellular cyanotoxins that might be in that water um, and make, that, make it more challenging uh, from that standpoint. So those are just some some ideas, but I'm going to talk in, in a few minutes about other special studies that can be done. And, and, and the... the um, the kind of the tricky part about optimizing a water system for an HAB event is that the events are sometimes unique. Tom and Larry both talked about situations that occurred at water systems that had not occurred prior to those occurrences. And so the events are unique and, and then the water treatment plants are unique also. So uh, um, there might be some other approaches that would apply to a particular plant in a particular, uh, during a particular water system uh, uh, event at that water system that it just fits that perfectly. So water system operators have to be flexible and have to uh, continually look for how, how can I adjust my processes in a way that might address uh, my needs here and uh, how can I set up a special study to test 
whether or not I can do that successfully. Can I set up a specialist study prior to an HAB event? And if not, what specialist study do I need to do during the HAB event? So let's talk about some approaches in general that we might take at the filters. Now, remember the filters don't remove as large a portion generally of the uh, algae cells, but still we can we can try to uh, uh, optimize their, their uh, treatment also. In general, um, we try to uh, 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 support a, a, an optimization uh, approach for filters where each filter will um, produce water that does not exceed 0.1 NTU turbidity. And we've found that that water system and filters that can meet that optimization goal are also better at removing algae cells that might uh, con contain intracellular um, uh, cyanobacteria or intracellular cyanotoxins. Um, in, in the case of filters during an HAB, an operator can consider increasing the backwash frequency. Backwash initiation may depend on hours in service during the event rather than say turbidity or uh, perhaps head loss, which might be the trigger for a back loss, uh, backwash ordinarily if there was not an HAB going on. And so uh, again, um, if we're gonna trap the, the uh, cyanobacterial cells in the filter, let's hold them there as, uh, as a low amount of time as possible and, and move them out uh, after their trap. Special studies to document the performance improvement from re reduced backwash initiation rates can be conducted because, you know, uh, if I start changing my uh, triggers for backwashes, that might affect how effective my filter is at removing turbidity. And that might also affect how well it removes the uh, uh, cyanobacteria. So if I backwash more frequently, how do I do that in a way? Do, do I need to uh, change my backwash rate or change the duration of my backwash or something? And I can do that. I can do those types of studies prior to an HAB event, just using turbidity perhaps as an indicator on, on my day-to-day -day water. Uh, before measuring cyanotoxins before and after the backwashes may be a challenge. It, you know, any monitoring that you can glean from Tom's uh, uh, presentation might be a challenge. But if you've got a target organism that you can or or test that you can use to to um, indicate your target organism, it would be good to get a before and after backwash sample if possible. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about utilizing jar testing to identify optimal chemical dosages for clarification. Uh, and this is an example that came from a water system that want, where the operators wanted to understand the effect of um, uh, their coagulant and the effect of um, sodium uh, permanganate that they were feeding on coagulation efficiency and cyanotoxin releases. So they're feeding some... Um, sodium permanganate, and they're asking, well, is that is that releasing some cyanotoxin? Is that is that lysing some cells or releasing it? And if so, to what extent? And they're also wanting to know if their coagulant feed at the current feed rate is having an effect on clarifying those cells out. So they decided to do a, a jar pr test procedure, and they decided to augment the jars with a concentrated cyanobacteria bacteria solution because you know if you're not in the middle of an HAB event you might not have much of a uh, eight, uh cyanotoxin concentration uh, to perform these tests with and and these guys wanted to test this when they were not in an HAB event so they they used a phytoplankton net and they gathered I don't know where they gathered the um the 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 algae from it was either during an HAB event and then they somehow preserved it, or maybe they went to another source or something. I don't know, but they did. They did obtain some that they could then um, inject into the jars to kind of seed the jars. 
So they added the coagulant at their plant dose, which happened to be 24 milligrams per liter, and they added permanganate, uh, sodium permanganate at their current plant dose, which was 1.2 milligrams per liter, and they tested the permanganate at a higher dose, up at three, to see if that would have any difference, make any difference. They tried to mix the jars at equivalent mixing energy to, uh, to uh, simulate the turbulence in the raw water main and the flocculation processes. <clears throat> Because, um, you know, if you have a jar test procedure and say, because now that they've seeded the jars with uh, bacteria, uh, uh, cyanobacteria, they could end up lysing, if they, if they start uh, imparting too much energy into the jar test, they could end up lysing c uh, cells in their jar. And, and, and if that's not what's happening in the main, then that's, that jar test is not going to be a good reflection of what's happening in the, in the, uh, in the water system at, at the plant scale. So they want to try to get the mixing energies the same just to kind of in the jar as it is at the plant scale to, to make sure it's um, uh, not uh, skewing the data. So here's what they got for results. Um, you see the... Um, the darker blue bars here are total microcystin, and the, the lighter kind of crosshatch bars are extracellular. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the jar mark zero here is the augmented raw. So that's they've augmented the water with the, the, the harvested uh, cyanobacteria. And in, in the jar, when they ran that, they found they had, uh, looks like about 26 or 27 micrograms per liter um, total microcystin in that jar. That's, I guess, what they seeded it with. The extracellular was down here around two or three, it looks like. <clears throat> and in, in jar one, now they've stirred it. So the, the, there shouldn't be much change in the total microsystems just from stirring the water. Uh, there was a slight change, and that could be a, an analysis difference. And the extracellular was very similar also. In the next jar over, they're using their plant dose only of, of uh, 24 milligrams per liter aluminum chlorhydrate. And you can see, just as Tom reported earlier, uh, the extracellular now uh, in, in that jar comes, or in that trial, I guess, comes way down. And it's, uh, it goes from uh, up over 25 down to below uh, five micrograms per liter. So they, they made the, the conclusion that the coagulant was effective in creating a flock that trapped and removed microcystin cells. It, they call it microcystin cells here, algae cells, whatever. And then the third, uh, in the third jar, they added their, their current plant dose of the permanganate. And the fourth, they uh, increased the permanganate from 1.2 up to three. And they, their conclusion there is that the sodium permanganate addition slightly increased the removal of microcystin at the plant dose. See this blue, their, this blue line went from, you know, looks like four here down to three and a half or something. So it slightly improved it. And then a little further down at the higher dose, and it also increased the extracellular portion. So even though the total it might be going down a little bit here, the extracellular portion of that is going up because the extra um, oxygen is lysing a, a little bit, is lysing more of those cells. So that's an example where they they use the a, a jar test to check their present. Uh, um, coagulant dose to see how well it was removing microcystins, and they actually found that they had quite a bit of removal here. And they were looking at uh, uh, what effect their uh, uh, permanganate feed was having. You could also use it to test mixer speeds as, as a, you know, if you want to gently settle algae cells and you say, you know, what would happen if I uh, rapid mix, turn my rapid mix speed down, would I still get good mixing? And would that uh, tend to uh, uh, benefit me by not releasing more uh, micro, uh, 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 cyanotoxins into the extracellular uh, solution? So you could do that in a jar, and then if you knew how to scale that up to a full plant, if you found a jar speed that was more gentle and still effective at removing the cells and removing turbidity, you could then uh, try to scale that up uh, uh, to the plant 
uh, uh, scale and see if that worked there. You could also, as another example of, of different hypotheses you can check, you could uh, look at what if I discontinued my pre-oxidant feed and uh, I could use my jar test that, to find an increased coagulant dose to offset the decreased coagulation efficiency when the, that feed is discontinued. I can use a jar for that. Um, but some considerations about jar tests. Um, if I'm doing my jar testing um, prior to an HAB event, and, because I want to get as much of this done uh, upfront as possible when I'm not under the pressure of, of an emergency situation. It, during the HAB event, if, if, if the water temperature is now different, it might, uh, it might cause the clarification process to, to work differently. So I might have to make allowances for that. If, if I'm, I've changed significantly the flow rates or the hydraulics of the plant from the time I ran my jar test to uh, what, what is running now during an HAB event, I may have to change my interpretation accordingly, or at least adjust it. Um, there are, as Larry mentioned, if I do have an algae bloom, the water may behave differently because I may have a higher negative par particle charge densities. And, it, and so I can still run the jar test prior to the HAB and, and start seeing how things might shape up for my plant. But I've got to consider these things. Um, when the HAB event does uh, uh, occur, maybe I can run another jar test uh, at least, but I would have at least some idea of what the settings needed to be. Uh, um, or uh, maybe I can uh, uh, make more subtle adjustments to my previous jar test findings. And I also have to need to consider the impacts of alternative chemical feeds on coagulation. So if I start feeding higher PAC, or, 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 or maybe I wasn't feeding powdered activated carbon at all before the uh, HAB event, and now I'm feeding it at a high dosage, that could also affect my jar test results. And, and, and I might have to, uh, you know, I could, I could try to do that pre-HAB by adding the powdered carbon to a jar test and, and say to myself, let's hypothetically add some carbon because I might be doing that during the HEB. But those things need to be considered. These are just considerations. Um, and uh, as I said before, mixing, if, if I want to settle things gently, then mixing energy becomes important. So I should try to find a way to um, approximate those plant scale mixing energies within my jar and have some idea that, that, that I'm kind of getting the same ones. And if you look down at the second bullet here, it says a jar testing guideline is provided in the training materials link. It, if, uh, there's a folder uh, that I think is called resources. And then within that folder, there's a subfolder that uh, references uh, TSB. Uh, technical services branch from EPA. And within that folder, you'll find the jar testing guideline that Larry put together from PAI. And, and on the second page of that guideline, it kind of gives a general idea. If your hydraulics are this, then, then your mixing energy is in this range and your, your jar test might be set up in a similar range. So it gives, it gives a starting point uh, to try to get the mixing energy dialed in. And that could be done prior to an HAB. Uh, time for settling to simulate that of the plant. You know, you you would have a, a uh, uh, you should have an idea of how long you should settle the water in the jar test to, so that the flock particle behaves the same way the one at full scale does. In in a jar test, you'd only have to settle what three or four inches and in, and. In, um, you know, a full scale plant, it's, it's got feet that it has to settle. So that could be done prior to an HAB. How long, uh, do some special studies to figure out how long do I need to let the jar test sit for until um, I get results that are similar to, the, similar to that on, on plant scale. And um, all, another consideration is, you know, be, uh, be aware of your chemical feeds into the jar. And so, if you're adding a chemical that you don't think really uh, affects 
the clarification process directly, you still might add it to the jar because it might have some effect that you're, you're not aware of. Maybe you're adding fluoride or something up front. I don't know. But if there is something in there, you might think about, uh, do I need to add that also? I'm going to jump in, Bill. You got about 10 minutes on, on your presentation. Thank you, Larry. Uh, and ideally, jar test procedures that approximate hydraulics and performance for uh, advanced non-conventional process should also be dealt. So if I've got one of these processes, I have to think about, you know, if I have a solids contact clarifier, how do I do a jar test for that process to, uh, uh, to approximate the mixing energy and get the performance, the same performance that I get at full scale. And there's a little photo here of someone who has a jar tester that has little air diffusers in it because they have a dissolved air flotation clarification process and that the, these things help simulate that in the jars. Um, <clears throat> flipping over to the filters now and, and things that we can do there. Um, we can for, um, to look at the, we can look at the historical performance of our filters and track the filter performance using every plant should have individual filter effluent turbidity data. And if I can take those data and figure out what the daily maximum was from each uh, filter of that, and, and maybe the plant has 15 minute data or, or maybe it has one minute data, I don't know, but it, it, they sh you should have many data points each day. And if you can find the maximums and then uh, look at, also look at the trend line and say, are the maximums occurring following backwash, you know, immediately following backwashes or at plant startups or when flow rates change? That might indicate to me a critical time for uh, the, the, that filtration process. And that will give me some idea of how to optimize that process by addressing the performance at those times. This is a, a graph where we've looked at what, 10 months worth of data here. Uh, from three uh, different filters at the same time. And these are daily maximums. And you can see we want to keep it below 0.1. And all three of these filters were doing a good job of doing that. You don't really see any spikes here of any large degree. And um, uh, so there are, it doesn't look like there's any uh, specific startup or, or hydraulic changes here. This is kind of showing that all the filters are, are 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 acting in a similar fashion and and there aren't any any issues that jump out but so but reviewing trend lines and historical data can can be a valuable tool in evaluating filters and then the other thing is um i i can i could review the trend lines prior to an hab event and try to dial in those filters and those the operations of those filters and i can also use alarms during the HAB event. So if I'm, I've looked at my historical data and I'm trying to dial in those filters, in the meantime, what's happening today, I can set alarms and use those alarms to, to uh, notify me when turbidity rates are starting to go up and something is being uh, uh, not operating as well as it, it should. Okay, I'm gonna, I do want to talk about powdered activated carbon and how to optimize the application of carbon before we finish up this process. Um, it's added prior to the clarification process and removed after having sufficient contact time to absorb the extracellular cellular toxins. So there are different types of carbon, powdered activated carbon, made from different source materials and. Um, that is something that uh, a water system operator might run some tests on um, to see um, if he does start having an HAB bloom, maybe get uh, some different products and see which type of carbon might be the best PAC product for him to use, uh, given the, that uh, compound. Um, the removal depends on the type of carbon. It also <clears throat> depends on the dose. Uh, Larry mentioned earlier, the, the higher the dose, generally the better the removal. And it depends on the contact time. Usually the longer the contact time, the more removal you get. And also whether or not you have other organics in the water that might interfere. There's, uh, you know, in the activated carbon, there's these sites here where uh, cyanotoxins would get trapped. And if there's competition for these sites from other chemicals, you might not get as much removal. Here's some results from some jar testing that was done with powdered activated carbon in uh, 
This is a, a run that was done with no powdered activated carbon. And you can see the extracellular toxin concentration here. <clears throat> um, that kind of stayed up here between 15 and 20, but was coming down a little bit. Maybe some of that jar was, uh, maybe some of it was coming down with the um, uh, uh, lock somehow being swept out. Well, then when you added the PAC, it, it was quite a bit lower. So that's, that's the extent of the removal you're getting there using that absorption. And this is another uh, run here in similar, um, uh, the the extracellular is brought way down, and it, it asks the question over here: uh, as why is it going when you don't have the PAC? Why is it going up? And I'm not sure, uh, but it could be you could be lysing uh, uh, cells with the coagulant that's also in the water, or something, or or if there's an oxidant in the water, I don't know. But this is showing time, and it's showing how much removal you get when you when you first add the PAC. You might not get much removal, but then it's it's uh, you may, maybe they added it up here. Then they're getting more and more removal as time goes on. So, and we we also talked about you'll get better removal uh, if if with larger dosages uh, of PAC normally. <clears throat> so. You can see here at different dosages, 20, uh, 10, 20, 30, and 40 uh, milligrams per liter. After a certain number of hours, say four hours here, we'll look at, you're getting more, the more PAC you've added, the more removal you get. So how to optimize PAC feed is assessing how much can I feed? You know, what's the maximum? And you can do this before an HAB event. Knowing the maximum feasible feed rate will facilitate developing an HAV event strategy. How much can we feed? And we have to uh, consider the feeder pump. You, we might have a, uh, a feeder pump uh, for the PAC slurry. And what's that capacity? We have to consider if I'm adding opening PAC sacks and uh, manually dumping them into a hopper, how much manual labor would it take to feed, say, 20 milligrams per liter or 30 milligrams per liter or 40? And is that feasible? And sometimes it's not. And we have to look at the cost. You know, uh, it, hopefully an HAB event will be short lived, but we have to look at, uh, you know, if I want to, uh, feed large amounts of PAC, how much will that co cost for a short period of time? The feed lines where I've added PAC to a mixer here and formed a slurry, and then you know I'm presumably bringing this out to the rapid mixer or something, uh, that must be kept from clogging. Larry mentioned clogging is an issue uh, earlier. And uh, you know we wanna keep the velocity of that slurry in that line up high enough to keep things from clogging. Uh, if we shut the plant down, how do we resuspend re that slurry and get all the clogs out of the uh, feed lines at that time? And one of the things that can be doing is eliminating as many bends as possible in that feed line, uh, that uh, increasing the diameter of feed lines sometimes is necessary at higher dosages. Uh, making the feed lines as short as possible is always, you know, beneficial. Beneficial, and there is, you know, if if possible, we could consider increasing the uh, water ratio of the carrier water in the slurry uh, going through those feed lines. And also, in addition, the question becomes: Can we remove the sludge if I'm adding a large concentration of PAC, 20, 30, 40 milligrams per liter? That's going to form a heavy sludge in my clarifier, and it may impact my ability to remove sludge, and it may damage my sludge rake. So, uh, you could, you know, do some trial runs with powdered carbon when there's not an HAB, and say, I think I can add 40 milligrams per liter. And normally, I when there's a taste and odor event, I I might add five. Well, let's try 10 and see if the plant can handle that. Now let's try 15 and work up to 40 and just give the plant a stress test. And, and you could also find out from that stress test whether or not there's any issues with clogging or manually feeding the sacks and all those sorts of things. And also, uh, if, if we're not removing all the PAC in the uh, uh, 
uh, clarifier. It we also have to consider the fact that it may impact filter loading on a short-term basis during an HEB. And also, is the dosage limited by bulk PAC storage capacity? If I want to uh, feed these high amounts of PAC during a HAB event, do I have enough PAC storage uh, on site at my uh, uh, facility to be able to do that? And how how often do I need to get trucks in here with new batches? And can I do that? And I have to get all that lined up. Uh, as you all know, uh, powdered activated carbon is kind of a dangerous chemical and has to be stored uh, properly. It has to be well ventilated. You don't want any other, in general rule is just um, uh, store it somewhere without any other chemicals. But if it is stored next to a chemical, it needs to be one that it doesn't react with. Um, so those things need to be uh, considered. So um, you can estimate PAC dosages necessary. And, and a lot of times though, um, it, and there is an AWWA spreadsheet that can help you with that. But a lot of times, you know, it's, uh, you, you don't know what the HAB event is gonna look like prior to uh, it happening. So you kind of say, well, let me develop a worst case scenario. Can I feed 30 milligrams per liter? Can I feed 40? And if I can, then I'm going to feed it because it, uh, if I've stress test my plant, let's say, and, it, and I found I can do 40 milligram, micrograms, excuse me, milligrams per liter PAC feed uh, for for a couple of weeks at a time, I'm going to feed. Uh, I may just take the approach in my uh, 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 plan uh, to feed that much, and even if uh, a jar test might say I can do it with a, a smaller amount. But you could do, you could start off with a higher dosage and then do some uh, plant profiles and see, you know, lower the dosage if it doesn't, if it isn't breaking through. Uh, there is a jar testing guideline provided with the training that's also useful for setting up a jar test for PAC. Uh, and jar test parameter measurements are, you know, anytime we're measuring actual cyanotoxins, it's a challenge. Um, there may be some indicators of good, or if, if, if a water system doesn't have a way to measure these things, we might just say, hey, what's the maximum amount I can feed? I'm in my plant, given a stress test and just go with that. The other thing we can do is try to increase the time that the PAC is in contact with water. Uh, find places to feed PAC with maximum contact time as close to the source as possible. So. Maybe normally I would feed uh, my PAC at the rapid mix. Well, can I bring it back here to the source water and get the extra contact time in the pipe going from the source water to the uh, uh, rapid mix? So I went through that last part quickly, Larry, because you told me I didn't have much time left. But in summary, uh, we, uh, we can uh, 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 optimize existing surface water treatment facilities for removal of intracellular cyanotoxins through operational changes. And we can do special studies to investigate either lowering or eliminating the pre-oxidant dose, removing clarifier sludge more often and what effect that might have on other parameters or whatever. This continually recycle and what effect that might have. Dialing in chemical feed dosages, we can do jar test studies and and try to simulate an HAB event uh, prior to it happening, but then we can also do them during the HAB event, try to dial in our, our chemical feeds. Optimizing turbidity removal of clarifiers and fil filters, we can look at historical data. Uh, we can make sure we've got our uh, set points on our alarms where, where they need to be. And then to uh, <clears throat> remove extracellular cyanotoxins, we can optimize existing surface water treatment plant uh, facilities um, uh, to evaluate PAC feed capabilities, our pump capacities, whether or not we have clogging issues, whether or not we can manually feed the PAC sacks into hoppers, whether or not we can, our sludge disposal system can handle the high concentrations and whether or not we have adequate storage facilities to store the, the additional PAC we're gonna have to feed at that time. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment.
and we're going to go into the first workshop. <clears throat> uh, Jan, you wanted to come in. 